Our next presentation, Dr. Monica Cooper, who is the Napa, Napa County um, a and advisor for viticulture with UC Cooperative Extension. Today, she is going to be talking about boots on the ground, problem solving and diagnosing unusual symptoms in the field. Thank you, Monica. Thanks, Cindy. Um, and uh, thanks, Chris. That was actually a really great introduction to my topic because as these things are happening, um, we actually need to understand what we're seeing in the vineyard. So I'm going to talk about how sort of the process we go about in trying to figure out whether we have a biotic, an abiotic, or maybe even a combined stressor event. So um, for those of you who aren't as familiar with, you know, Farm Advisors and Cooperative Extension, we, we do a lot of based research. We do things like this and give presentations or organize seminars. But one of the other things that we do quite a bit is go out and look at unexpected or unusual things that are happening and try to do some problem solving. So I'm going to walk us through the important aspects of diagnostics. Um, so a lot of people, you know, I'll find that someone will send me just this photo of a leaf and say, what's going on? And I say, well, okay, many different things are going on because sometimes symptoms can look very similar, but be caused by very different things. So a lot of times when I get something like that, I say, well, okay, I need a little bit more information. Um, I need to know where that leaf was in the plant. Was that the only leaf in the vineyard that looked like that? Or did they all look like that? Um, and so collecting observations in the field is really important. So we'll go through sort of the steps and, and important aspects of that. As part of that, you need to keep records and gather information. So it helps to know, you know, definitively what rootstock you're, um, you're planted on. Sometimes we have cases of um, scion mix up. So I've seen something that, you know, is supposed to be Cabernet Sauvignon. And it turns out there's a mix of cabs, Infidel, and Mavedra in, in the planting. So keeping records and gathering information is, is another really important aspect because you'll need to look back at that as you're problem solving. And then as uh, Chris walked us through, we need to consider both biotic and abiotic factors. So um, one of the first steps of collecting observations in the vineyards is to observe your symptoms and look for patterns. So you're gonna look at where on the vine are these symptoms occurring? Which parts of the vine are affected? Is it only the leaves? Is it you know short shoots and reduced growth sort of across the vine? Is it only on one side of the cordon versus another side of the cordon is growing fine? Um, how's your fruit set? How do your fruit how does your fruit look? Um, but then you also want to consider, okay, is this isolated within the block or is it clumped within the block? Maybe um, one um, area is where you're seeing the symptoms and not in other areas. And then at the landscape level. So you may see symptoms in one block, but if you look around at surrounding blocks, do they also have symptoms? Or say, is there a certain elevation above which or below which you're getting most of your symptoms? So um, one of the important things about symptoms is when did they appear? So if they appeared after a weather event, such as a heat, frost, or a hail, or did they, were they timed pretty nicely with a spray application? And here's an example of symptoms appearing in relation to cover crop management. So uh, false chinch bug really prefers brassicas as a host. And so in years when our sort of rainfall and climatic conditions are favorable to have a large mustard cover crop, and sometimes when that cover crop is not cultivated or mowed in a timely fashion, we can see buildup of chinch bug both on that cover crop and then in the video that you're seeing on the right, they'll actually stay and continue to feed even in the residue of that. And a consequence of that 
is that we can see damage from false chinch bug feeding, particularly to young vines, but it's not limited to young vines. I've definitely seen it in older vineyards as well. Um, and it usually is coincides with something related to a brassica management. So you need to think about what your cover crop was and then when it was managed. And as I said earlier, we think about are the symptoms on the single part of the plant? So are only the leaves affected or are these symptoms seen really across the vine? So in this uh, photograph that you're seeing here, we have these sort of spots and we'll go through this example in detail later, but you see these spots on the shoots, on the tendrils, on the petioles, and even on the rachis. So something like that is very different from Pierce's disease where yes, the leaves may, the leaves may be affected by the scorch, but then you're also seeing um, the shriveled berries and uneven um, lignification or maturation symptoms on the shoots. And another thing you want to look at is what age of tissue is affected. So is it something in the, where the younger leaves are affected? So maybe a nutrient is not getting transported from the older to the newer leaves. Is it only the older leaves? Is it all ages? Or is it really only one age leaf where you can see that maybe something happened environmentally at a certain growth stage and then that was a one-time event, but then the vines were able to grow out of that. Another thing that's really important, and you, you'll know how important it is because in the back of my vehicle, I have a shovel in there permanently uh, because when we have poor above ground um, growth, we need to look below ground as well. So not only do you need to look at sort of the integrity of the graft union, but then also consider where you whether you might have scion rooting or overall just poor growth of the rootstock related to soil conditions or water availability or some other um, biotic or abiotic factor. And so what you're seeing in these photographs here is crown gall um, resulting from a winter cold damage that resulted in damage to the vines. And so then the agrobacterium um, was mm, initiated in its damage response from its latency. And so what you ended up getting are these galls that are forming. And I've seen after winter damage, galls not only at the, um, at the graft union, but also all the way up and down the trunk. I have photos of them out onto the cordons as well. So we always wanna be inspecting not only a root growth, but also the graft union. And in some cases, I'm saved from shoveling by the fact that we're able to bring a backhoe. So I'm always very grateful of that for that, particularly when I'm trying to, you know, dig in a Carnero soil in the middle of summer. So, okay. Um, another thing you're going to want to look at is the pattern of symptoms and how they're occurring within the block. So are they clumped? as in these photos showing a red blotch disease symptom progression through blocks, are they randomly showing up or is there some relationship to slope or aspect or exposure that we can say, okay, so it's perhaps related to some heat or another type of weather event that may have happened due to exposure. And another th great thing to look for is whether the symptoms are limited by row. And in that case, um, a lot of times the explanation can be related to a pesticide application. So as diligent as we are at some times, something that should not be sprayed to the canopy um, gets put into the tank. So our um, emeritus um, weed science advisor will tell you that yes, he has seen glyphosate applied to a grapevine canopy, not on purpose, but accidents do happen. And so it's really important to look at patterns to say like, okay, well, it ends in this row, that's probably consistent with 
you know, one tank's full of spray. And then when the applicator went back, that mistake was not made again. So you need to not only check your pesticide application records, but then have conversation with the applicators and go out and actually look at your pesticide sheds and try to make sure or figure out if something unintended was um, applied to the canopy or potentially at a rate that was not intended either. Um, and beyond just looking at the symptoms within your blog, sometimes you need to think about throughout the ranch or the neighborhood. So for example, following uh, a severe weather event, you may, we, the symptoms may not be limited to a single vineyard, but may be shared by neighbors or across a region. And we can learn a lot by talking to our neighbors and seeing how um, symptoms that we're seeing match what they're seeing. And then also in, in blocks that do have those symptoms, what are the similarities in those blocks? So are there similarities in exposure, in elevation, in phenology, scion, rootstock, soil, or water status? And then one thing, you know, when we go out to the vineyard, I don't just look at the grapevines. So in the picture here, you know, this severe flooding. Well, in the spring, not only will those, may those vines growth be affected, but you're also unlikely to see very good growth of the cover crop. So if you drive through certain regions in the spring and you see where the cover crop growth has been affected, well, a lot of times those are can be low points where water has collected. And so that gives you some information about what might have happened based on looking at other plants and considering other plants as well as grapevines. As I've mentioned, gathering information and keeping records is very important. So these are the types of information that you're probably gonna to wanna to refer back to your information from your weather stations, from your pesticide applications, from um, amendments. Uh, we had some interesting conditions this year where um, a couple of blocks didn't set any fruit and we tied it back to nitrogen applications in the spring. I've seen um, canopy work in suckering where um, trunk suckers were removed. And after that, very soon after that, a glyphosate spray was applied. Well, we saw damage because there was green tissue on the trunks that had been exposed by that trunk suckering. So there's all kinds of different combinations of things that can happen. And unless you have really good records of when you've done a certain activities, it can be really hard to go back and, and, and piece together the explanation for that. And the other thing is to look at whether this is a recurring issue or not. So some of this is just experience in that we've may have seen this before and under these certain conditions, and this is what happens. So keeping records and, and remembering um, how symptoms look under certain conditions. So I wanted to go through a couple of real world examples. Um, I had to whittle down my um, my vast library. Well, not vast library, but you know we've seen some interesting things over the years. So in this case, we had some leaf distortion, bushy growth, lots of latent buds pushing. We had really short internodes and sort of zigzaggy internode growth. Um, and it's important to note for this that it's an organically farmed vineyard. So you look at that and you say, oh, well, okay, I wonder what, what's going on. Here's these distorted leaves. Um, why are all these latent buds pushing? Is this some sort of pathogen? Um, and we also saw a very strong pattern at the edge. So these, these vines at the edge were affected. You got a certain number of vines in and they seem to be entirely unaffected by this phenomenon. And what we saw was that when we looked at the edge of the block, there were rose bushes that were planted. And even though the vineyard was farmed organically, somebody forgot to tell the gardeners and the gardening crew that grapevines are sensitive to glyphosate and please don't use them close to vines that are growing. Okay. Uh, here's another example where we had 
really scorched leaves. This is right at the onset of Eurasian here. You can see that the, the um, crop is unaffected, but the leaves are uh, severely scorched and the vine growth is affected. Here's some closer photos of that, again, to show that at this point, the fruit's not affected. However, you know, this is not a great canopy for continuing to ripen your fruit. Um, and you can say, okay, well, leaf scorch. Oh, I, I learned about leaf scorch. That's Pierce's disease. Well, if you look at the photograph on the left, you can see the pattern of the scorching on the leaves. And it's different from the pattern of scorching that we see with Pierce's disease. So with Pierce's disease, yes, you do see these necrotic areas and scorched areas of the leaves, but at that zone of interface between um, necrotic tissue and live tissue, you see these sort of yellow and reddish, bright yellow and reddish areas of the leaf. And so that pattern is really consistent with PD. We didn't see that in this example. The other thing is that the, you have sort of full maturation here of these cans versus with Pierce's disease where you have the green islands of, of tissue within the, the mature cans. And as I mentioned, we had the fruit that was um, really holding up in the um, in this example versus with Pierce's disease, um, one of the first symptoms that we see in the North Coast is uh, shriveled berries. So we started to looking at, okay, well, what's the pattern of occurrence? And it's right at the edge here along this drive road. <clears throat> I don't know if you can tell, but this drive road looks wet. Well, that's not water. That's, in fact, uh, a dust suppressant, so a salt-based dust suppressant, which, oops, was a little bit misapplied as the applicator was sort of turning the bend here and going down the hill, and you got run off over to the vines, and so what we're seeing is um, salt damage to the vines from that uh, dust suppressant. It's another yeah, interesting and fun example. Uh, in this case, the leaf blades are entirely gone. So we're seeing match thick petioles, but then also some regrowth. And you should note that this is a, a fairly young vine here. And again, okay, matchstick petioles, oh, I remember that from my classes, that's Pierce's disease, but in this case, it's not accompanied by any of the other Pierce's disease symptoms that we might expect. And, and also the vine is already growing back. So you have new growth and new leaf growth. So that leads me to think, all right, there must've been some kind of grazing damage. Well, did a deer get in there? No, it was deer fenced. This was in the middle of the vineyard, a single vine. And so even though we never found the culprit, we suspect that it was a sphinx moth larva which if you've ever grown tomatoes and you go to bed one night and you have a beautiful tomato plant, you wake up in the morning and your tomato plant is totally defoliated um, by a tomato hornworm. It's the same, um, the same idea here where the sphinx moth larva is voracious. It's actually fairly large, probably the size of one of my fingers uh, when it's a fully mature. And so they're voracious eaters and they can defoliate grapevines. We don't see them that commonly, but when you do, it can be pretty dramatic. But luckily in this case, the vine was growing back. So it did suffer that stress, but it is growing back. Okay, my last example, I'll talk about um, some symptoms that we saw both in 2019. So in 2019, we saw it at two different si sites. And we had this spotting on the leaves, on the shoots, on the tendrils, um, on the petioles, and in the on the flower clusters, on the rachis. And we didn't necessarily have a great explanation for it when it happened in 2019, but then it happened again this year. And this is when I feel like we got a really strong explanation for it based on the records that we have and the fact that it happened again. So sometimes we have something that we think based on one year's worth, but it takes a, an additional time to really be able to confirm it. So unfortunately it has to happen to more than one person sometimes before we get a good explanation. 
And the spotting and this, we thought, oh, well, okay, this is pretty similar to Phomopsis, right? You get spotting on the shoots. Um, it's something that you see in the spring. It can follow um, rainfall in the spring, which we did see in this example. I mean, you can see um, how wet those the vines are in this photograph. Uh, and so we thought, okay, well, maybe it's Phomopsis, but Phomopsis symptoms tend to be Although you do get um, damage to the shoots, it tends to be at the base of the shoots. And we also, because of that damage, the shoots get really unstable. So they break off really easily. And we weren't seeing any of those types of symptoms in this example. And in fact, we had symptoms in this example all the way up at the, at the, um, the shoot tip, as well as at the base of the shoot. And the other thing we look for with Phomopsis is evidence of fruiting bodies. So bleach canes and spurs with these um, fruiting bodies that are then um, releasing spores. Once the green shoots or the new shoots start growing and we have rainfall, then spores are released from these fruiting bodies and they colonize. And then the pathogen colonizes the green tissue. And then that's when you get damage. So we had pretty much ruled out Phomopsis, even though it, it looked similar. And again, here's some more close-up photos of how we were getting damage also to the rachis and to the tendrils. So by looking at the pattern and distribution throughout the vine, we also looked at the pattern. So it was in one of the vineyards, it was the shady side of the vine that was affected and the side that was got sun and warmed up and dried off earlier in the morning was unaffected. And so we looked at our pesticide application records. And we noted that in each case, an oil spray um, immediately preceded symptom development. And in all cases, we had very high humidity um, where this lingering fog all day long and very cool temperatures. And also the fact this, this matches up with the fact that we were seeing it on the shady side of the vine. And so I'm looking into the literature a little bit, you start looking that, well, we're very familiar with the fact that oil sprays under hot weather can result in phytotoxicity, but it does turn out that under conditions of wet plant tissue, you can also get phytotoxicity. And that's because the um, conditions of high relative humidity can inhibit evaporation of your crop oil. And then because it doesn't evaporate, it, it just stays on the plant and that's where you get the phytotoxicity. And if you look at how the, um, if you look at the spots themselves, they look like um, uh, a, a water sensitive paper that you might put out to assess your spray. So I guess this is kind of a way of looking at your spray um, and how successful your, your spray application was. You wouldn't want to do that. You just want to look at, um, use water sensitive papers for that. But um, this is a condition that, that has happened. And as we get, as Chris was saying, sort of more spring rain, maybe warmer conditions, we have growth earlier in the season, it might be something that could become more common. So I hope this gave you a good introduction to the types of different things that we're looking for and how to go about really kind of being a detective. So it's it can be intimidating at first because maybe you can't necessarily figure out exactly what's going on, but it's a really great opportunity to really you know, put your thinking cap on and your observation cap and start looking and problem solving and trying to figure out um, what what might be going on. So with that, I can stop sharing and take any questions. Okay, so Michelle is going to come on and ask you the question that we have in the Q&A currently. Yeah, so you had a photo. Um, the question is, is, is that photo the base of, I'm sorry, yes. is that photo of the base of the, of the shoot with a black ring of tissue right at the spur? Is it phimosis or is it the mystery problem? Um, no, that, 
Yeah, that that photo in particular, that's Phomopsis. So that was uh, trying to show that when you have Phomopsis, you have that damage at the base of the spur. Um, and whereas with the mystery problem, we did not see that type of damage. Okay, is there any other questions for Monica? Um, we'll wait just a couple seconds, see if anything comes through. <clears throat> Anybody got any weird photos to share? <laughs> oh gosh, I have some great ones. <laughs> you show up and you you look at all angles of a vine, and you're like, okay, so, well, <laughs> it's not that, it's not that. <laughs> you start checking off the list. <laughs> No. Okay, another one came through. Um, was there permanent crop injury from the oil spray? No. Okay. Um, yeah, and I get some interesting insect ones too, ones that end up on grapevines that you wouldn't expect. Um, I did get a acacia psyllid. Oh infesting grapevines and they're like what's going on and they just happened to uh, recently cut back the acacia trees yeah. and so they moved <laughs> you know the psyllid moved they don't want to go on grapevines but they had to go somewhere um so yeah it was a whole vine just covered in psyllids um it, yeah. it was enough to freak um the viticulturists out understandably so or blow-ins um, we see that in the spring too after strong weather events that um left larvae get blown from oak trees or from wherever onto the vines and then they'll feed and defoliate the vines but then you know it's just because getting back up into the tree is too you know too much of a burden so right they yeah. have to feed somewhere uh -huh. um there's another question um monica could you please type in your email address someone has some pictures to share with you <laughs> okay um if yeah, sure you can. Uh, we we do diagnostics on a county-based basis. So if you're not in Napa, it'd be great if you could share the pictures with either Christopher or Cindy as well. <laughs> yeah. 